So, um, hi everybody. Uh, thank you very much for joining us uh, to this uh, second session of uh, the day. My name is Theobistus. I'm a vascular surgeon from Athens Medical Center in Greece. And I have the great uh, honor to moderate this session. Um, Professor Meran, she couldn't make it from the US. Uh, so I will take uh, her role. And uh, today is a great pleasure to have a very nice panel uh, of different uh, experts in the um, vasculogenic uh, erectile dysfunction. A new chapter has opened there uh, the last years, and we have seen very uh, interesting results. So um, what uh, I would like to um, have is a fir my first slide here. Uh, please um, give me the, the first slide, the introduction. Well, the title is How Should You Approach Patients with a Vasculogenic Erectile Dysfunction? We're going to talk about uh, the, the way of treatment. However, it is also important to have information from uh, our experts about uh, how we're going to approach these patients and also the urologist uh, in order to have a nice cooperation and a multidisciplinary approach. Uh, here are, um, is our, ex our panel, please, the next slide. Uh, let me introduce you, uh, Mrs. Roxana Merhan. Um, she's going to talk about vasculogenic erectile dysfunction. We don't ask, they don't talk. Then we're going to have Giuseppe San Giorgi. Um, we're going to uh, talk about uh, mechanical revascularization and adjunctive therapies. Uh, and then Federico Dejo, a very uh, renowned and, uh, um, let's say, uh, a neurologist that he has supported this type of uh, treatment, who's going to talk about the European guidelines and what are the current recommendations. So um, I think we're going to start with the first presentation from uh, Roxana Merhan. He's going to be um, a recorded presentation. Uh, please. Hello. Um this is Roxana Moran. What a fantastic pleasure to come to you um, uh, to the LINK meeting 2022. And on this very important topic of vasculogenic erectile dysfunction, it's really an important topic because we often don't ask about it, we don't talk about it, and so therefore we don't learn much about it. It's important for you to note my disclosures, um, as you can see, but specific to this talk, I do receive, my institution receives uh, funding for a trial that is run by Concept Medical, who, who um, is uh, sponsoring this uh, particular sp symposium. I think it's important to define this. Obviously, erectile dysfunction is the recurrent inability to achieve and maintain an erection satisfactory for sexual intercourse. The successful treatment has a very strong impact on quality of life. And this is really important for us to kind of think about as we think about the quality of life of our patients that we're caring for. There is more than 300 million men worldwide with ED and 52% in the United States and between the ages of 40 to 80 years old report some degree of ED. In patients with CAD, this percentage goes up to 61% when we appropriately diagnose this. So this is an important issue in men's health. It negatively impacts quality of life, self-esteem, mental health being, which has then untoward effects towards relationships and so much more. The risk factors are tremendous. The ones that we particularly in this uh, Congress are interested in is the vascular causes, which are atherogenic or venous leakage, et cetera. But it is associated with diabetes, medications, pelvic surgery, radiation trauma, neurologic causes, as well as endocrine causes that we know of. The arterial anatomy is important to note. Obviously, the, the interest is usually in the pudental artery that uh, we are, uh, the internal pudental artery that we're extremely interested in. Uh, uh, off of the internal iliac and, and importantly has a, a very important um, blood supply uh, to the, to the pe penis as well as uh, for um, some of the atherosclerotic diseases there could have an important pathobiological causes of um, erectile dysfunction. What's really important to note is that erectile dysfunction is very, very common pathophysiology with CVD. 
Certainly the risk factors are similar, hypertension, diabetes, obesity, dyslipidemia, a lot of them leading to testosterone deficiency, causing inflammation, endothelial dysfunction. And in the initial stages, there is uh, obviously very, very important understanding of what this is and atherosclerosis really working closely with erectile dysfunction. And we often see um, a very, very important uh, plaque DS, 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 uh, D, uh, stabilization, as well as understanding very different from the coronary vasculature, uh, but important to understand that there is close pathobiology there that has been well documented and nicely pointed out. The luminal narrowing due to atherosclerotic burden can manifest very clinically early, earlier in penile arteries than in coronary arteries. They're a lot smaller and it could have an important impact there. And so for us to think about this as cardiologists who are seeing these patients and, and vascular specialists, it's something to actually ask a question when you're seeing patients with CAD, PAD, uh, peripheral vascular disease, and even venous disease to think about erectile dysfunction. Also, patients often experience cardiovascular events before they uh, report erectile dysfunction. So it's really important for cardiologists to be aware of this. Um, you know, when we talk about women's health, we're asking them to, to talk about menarche and, and um, early, you know, polycystic ovarian disease, all those important sex-specific questions. But often we're very shy about ED. And this is really important for us to kind of think about how, um, these patients who have come in with cardiovascular events actually report incident erectile dysfunction. So at the end of the day, erectile dysfunction is really the tip of the iceberg because if you start asking that question, you can actually get um, down to the bottom of cardiovascular disease and, and peripheral vascular disease that these patients often have. And of course, there are many, many treatment options that could improve the quality of life and early detection and management of CVD could go along with that and improving their health outcomes. So I believe it is really, really important for us. And on this symposium, we're gonna hear about some of these very, very interesting treatment options, especially with drug-coated balloons in treating the atherosclerotic issues and luminal narrowing in the pudental artery. I wanna thank you for your attention and for having me. And I look forward to being there in person very, very soon. Thank you again. Perfect. Uh, we would like to thank Roxana uh, for this nice uh, overview of the problem. Now let's have the second presentation from Federico Dejo, what European guidelines recommends for uh, ED treatment. Federico, welcome. Uh, thank you. I can see the screen because there is a presentation of Giuseppe San Giorgi on my screen. Can you fix it, please? I, so, okay. So first of all, thanks obviously for the kind invitation. It's uh, an honor and a pleasure to speak in such a such a nice uh, uh, contest. I have already uh, uh, give you my presentation, or I have to share my screen. What do you prefer? I don't know. Let's see what the people say here. Do we have the presentation? So should he share his screen? Okay. Yes. I'm doing that. Just a moment, just a moment. Uh, should, should we go for the next of uh, Giuseppe? Or... Just a moment, Federico. So I will do my PowerPoint, I understand well. Just a moment, Federico. Uh, okay, we are ready. Please. Okay, great, great, thank you, great, thank you. Uh, so next slide, or I move? No, you should move. Uh, okay. So please, next slide. Uh, 
Okay. So what is erectile dysfunction, as already been said, is, a, is a define the persistent inability to attain and maintain an erection sufficient to permit a satisfactory sexual performance. This is one of the first uh, uh, things to remember. Then I don't want to stress you with the physiology of erection. I'm a urologist and andrologist, but the penine erection is a neurovascular event modulated by physiological factors and hormonal status. So it should be considered a neurovascular event. That's the main important thing to remember. Is a massive uh, huge number of uh, person and people who are suffering with this uh, um, with this uh, with this illness and uh, this uh, landmark paper since uh, 1994, the Massachusetts Male, Male Agency Studies uh, stressed that 52% men age between 40 and 70 suffer by erectile dysfunction. This is a huge number of men Obviously, there are organic causes, vasculogenic, neurogenic, anatomical structure, but uh, as already been said before, obviously the hormonal status is very important, and also the use of drugs should be discussed with patient before think to treat patient. Trauma obviously is something that we can discuss also in a setting like interventional cardiologist or radiologist that we are speaking today. Pathophysiology uh, is very important, uh, uh, also the psychogenic erectile dysfunction. That is the only one who is curable. Then we see our uh, European urological guidelines said about this. There are main risk factors, as you see, age, cardiovascular, diabetes, smoking, obesity, metabolic syndrome, and all these kind of uh, patho pathology that are mixed and give you erectile dysfunction and patient in our office. So this is a paper from Paolo Capogrosso that worked with me and uh, uh, stressed the idea that in a real life setting, we can see that one out of four men, so 25% uh, below 40 years old, suffer by erectile dysfunction. And you, you should always assess this during a, a consultation. This is uh, how decrease the age of patients that arrive in our office um, searching for a cure or something that can help us to have nice intercourse and normal sexual life. That is something very important also for the mood of this patient. So we have cardiovascular risk faction, poor androgen uh, deprivation therapy. We have endothelial dysfunction, inflammation, give you atherosclerosis and erectile dysfunction and coronary artery disease that has already been said before, how they are similar. Moving to my topic uh, that are European guidelines, uh, first of all, we have medical and psychosexual history. So identify sexual problem, identify, identify common cause of erectile dysfunction and identify something can be reversed just to cure erectile dysfunction. That is different to cure erectile dysfunction or treat erectile dysfunction and their symptoms. There is the physical examination. Obviously, it should be done by a urologist or, or a cardiologist or a, or a physician, but penile deformity, prostatic disease, sign of hypogonadism and cardiovascular status should be always tested. Then there are lab tests that they are very, very easy. We have to, to, to check for diabetes, check for the level of testosterone. And this, have, this is the flow chart of our, uh, of our guidelines. I go just to not be very urologic, but be multidisciplinary contest. We should uh, satisfy the risk of cardiac status of patients according to Priestos concept in low risk, intermediate risk, and high risk. I don't want to teach anybody about this because I have to, uh, to study more about Priestos conference because I'm not a cardiologist, I'm a urologist. Then there are some specific tests that are urologic and andrologist that the patients should be scheduled if you suspect a vasculogenic erectile dysfunction, an arteriogenic erectile dysfunction, or other issue. So we have nocturnal penile tumors and rigidity scan or rigid scan, that is a machine that you wear on the, on the leg and uh, count the number of uh, spontaneous erection during the night. Then we have vascular studies intracavernous, Doppler, and internal, uh, two internal pudendal arteriography that is performed by radiologists. Uh, this gives you 
this very central topic of the guidelines, the treatment of erectile dysfunction. We should treat and identify if something is curable, lifestyle changing, and this is very important and not always done, unfortunately, and provide education and counseling. Erectile dysfunction can be treated with current treatment, but, is, but it cannot be cured. And get only psychogenic, post-traumatic, and hormonic we can cure. The other, we just treat symptoms. This is a post-traumatic, that obviously is a old surgery, but still performing some selective case. And what about the lifestyle change and risk modification? This is uh, something very important. Obviously, I have already said, not always is be performed, but I really trust in this kind of, uh, uh, of way of treat patient. Uh, in, in increase exercise, improving nutrition, nutrition and uh, control of weight, and quit smoking or drink alcohol. Uh, this is a meta-analysis with at least five uh, uh, six papers with uh, a lot of uh, population. Obviously, they are randomized, they are, uh, they are controlled, and you see that it works very nice. So remember to like to uh, treat patients with lifestyle modification is very useful. And this we arrive to the core, of, the core of my speech, that is erectile dysfunction treatment. We have some option. We have intracavalier injection, vacuum device, oral therapy with PD-5 inhibitors that uh, are the most common use, topical or intraurethral use of agent prostate not very used, and then we have other new uh, therapy that are two or three years that they are in the guidelines, a couple for some, that they are very useful and they are something that we can remember. So the patient should choose, choose the treatment. Obviously, the most uh, comfortable therapy is PD-5 inhibitors because they are pill and they work very nice. Now we will see some numbers. But there are patients who they are not respond to this, uh, uh, to this therapy. And so they, are, uh, they have to be counseled and they have to shift between this therapy since intracavers ingestion, vacuum device, and other, the other therapy. Then we have uh, uh, in LIESVT, a shockwave therapy that has a very robust uh, um, literature in the next five, in, in the past five years, and some something that we have to deal also with patient ask because is not invasive, minimal invasive, and works very nice. Here we see that at the end of this tree we have another way treatment outcome, and the, the last choice is a penile implants. That is a surgical procedure. So what guidelines says, use of PD-5 as first line therapeutic option is a strong, strong from European guidelines. You see, there are, these are the, the PD-5 inhibitors available in the market. They are, works very nice. Each drug is fantastic. They have difference in pharmacokinetics that so you, we can tailor it. Uh, we can tailor uh, therapy for each patient. There is the faster one, the longer one, uh, and also there are different in, in between Tmax and half time in concentration. Although this, there are PD-5 no responders because there are dropout, dropout between 45 and 78% after six to two years after. Because, because the efficacy is below the expectation. So roughly 50% of patients go out from PD-5 inhibitors. And so for the no responders, we should assess another time if there are change comorbidity, if there is something with inappropriate use, if there is something that we are not diagnosed like hormonal status or peroni disease, or there are psychological problems to fix with counseling. Uh, just a few words about intracavernous injection was the, uh, the, the ancient treatment of erectile dysfunction. Uh, it used alprostadil. There are also some mix, but they are not approved by FDA and MAA. Uh, so uh, with injection, they work. The erection appears after five minutes to the injection. Normally, patients don't love so much this therapy, but uh, it's true that if a patient starts with the right counseling, is happy also with intracavagous injection. The last uh, uh, 
uh, two slides about shockwave therapy. Sho what is shockwave therapy? Is uh, like uh, like uh, shockwave is done by orthopedic, also by urologist for treat treat stone. Is a piezoelectric uh, force that give you shockwave inside the vessels, inside the penis, as you can see in the last two two, two picture. And you see there are micro bubbles and give you increase of uh, nitric oxide. That is the same. Uh, way that works pills that use PD5 inhibitors at least uh, at the final uh, end of the metabolic way of, the, of their, uh, their activity, pills give you more uh, nitric oxide and also the SVT. This is not only is a physical way to increase uh, nitric oxide, the other one is uh, a chemical uh, uh, pharmacological way. And for people who don't respond, we have Pineal, uh, pineal prosthesis, that is the device with the, uh, the, the higher satisfaction rate for patient, but is always uh, a, clinic, a surgical procedure with some risk, and not all patients uh, love to have uh, pineal implants inside. So you have, uh, I think I've finished my, I finish my speech and I give you the idea of, of what the European guidelines says and what also the literature says about the therapeutic and diagnostic option. Thank you very much. Thank you very, very much, uh, Federico, for this nice overview. Um, so I have missed from these uh, European guidelines the uh, angioplasty of the penile artery as a strong recommendation. So this is now the time to hear if the mechanical revascularization should be added uh, to the uh, guidelines. And uh, we have one of the legends in this field, Giuseppe uh, San Giorgi. Uh, Giuseppe, um, I think we have the online... Uh, can we see the presentation of Giuseppe? I can't hear you. We have no audio. Please. We have no audio. Um, Giuseppe, uh, the people tell me that you have to share your presentation. Professor Dejo. We have some technical issues. Uh, so, uh, Giuseppe, can you hear us? We have no audio. Can, can you hear us? He cannot hear us, please. Giuseppe, I hear you, but I can see the main arena too. But I can't listen. Yeah, but I don't hear. Yeah, I can, Federico. I, I cannot hear the the moderator. I don't know if they if they hear us. Uh, however, I will share my screen, and I will uh, start the uh, presentation. I hope they are able to 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 see it. Uh, so basically, uh, I'm gonna. Uh, these are my uh, confident uh, disclosure uh, uh, screen. Uh, now, when, when we talk about uh, mechanical revascularization of uh, vasculogenic erectile dysfunction, Giuseppe? Giuseppe? Uh, we are, you know, uh, no. put together what the tradition says. Uh, 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 I don't know if they can Giuseppe, show can you hear us, Giuseppe? because somebody says. Can you see Federico my screen? I can. I see. I see Giuseppe. Oh, you see. You see. You see the screen. Okay. Uh, I. I. I don't know if they are able to. No, they said that they are not able to see it. From, okay. Uh, let's go. Uh, Giuseppe, can you hear us? From uh, Giuseppe, can you hear us? The audience. Okay, now now they fix it. Okay, so when 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 we talk about uh, uh, you know mechanical revascularization, we are talking about uh, you know what just uh, Federico said, uh, which is the tradition uh, versus a revolution of uh, treatment of, uh, of ED. 
Uh, you have just seen uh, what the European guidelines uh, says, uh, which are mainly represented by the uh, right side of the slide. When you do have a vasculogenic ED, guidelines recommend low-intensity shockwave therapy with or without PDA5 inhibitors. And of course, if this does not work, then uh, you know, uh, our uh, urologist colleagues, they move to a penile prosthesis implantation. So we, we do really are talking about a revolution in the field. And, uh, you know, of course, as any revolution or war, uh, I do believe that we, we need a roadmap uh, we need a mission, we need a strategy, and we need some weapons. And uh, my lecture will focus on, uh, of course, what do you need to know in order to create and start a revolution in uh, ED treatment. I believe that the roadmap is represented by this flowchart. So as a cardiologist, as vascular surgeons, we need to know that we will uh, you know, meet two types of uh, vasculogenic ED. You will have a problem, a patient with uh, tumescence and penetration problem. And of course, this is mainly related to arterial insufficiency, or you may also have an erection maintaining problem, which refers more to venous insufficiency. And of course, which is very common, you have a mixed insufficiency, which is represented by both arterial and venous insufficiency due to the fact that if you have no arterial flow, the cavernous body will not increase the pressure, will not increase the volume, and will not squeeze and close the vein, uh, the dorsal, dorsalis venous against the tunica albuginea, blocking the output from the penis. So this is our road map. Then we need a mission. And the mission is that, you know, Federico already stated that this is a multidisciplinary, uh, you know, problem. As a cardiologist, I can tell you that severe erectile dysfunction is significantly associated to cardiovascular risk. There is a, a relative risk of uh, 1.6 uh, for acute myocardial infarction, of uh, eight for congestive heart failure, peripheral vascular disease, and uh, cerebrovascular disease. So those are patients that we do see every day in our outpatient setting. And also the urologists know that you know, a patient who is affected by erectile dysfunction is, of course, a patient that needs, uh, you know, to be sent to a cardiologist due to the fact that there is a very strong association and correlation with coronary artery disease and peripheral artery disease. So the mission for us is the same that we uh, treat every day. These are patient that we see in our outpatient setting. As Dr. Meran stated, however, if we do not ask, they do not say. So we have to search, we have to <coughs> complete this mission. These are just to reinforce the take on message. There is a very strong link between erectile dysfunction and uh, uh, cerebrovascular disease. You can see, for instance, this was a very old study, the PAMPI study results, that has shown that patients with suspected coronary artery disease showing ED and, poor, and that are poorly responsive, which is very common, as Federico said, they do have atherosclerotic disease in their internal pudendal arteries that is usually focal in nature. The second mission that we do have, we need to identify and we need to categorize this type of patient. And we have a tool with a very simple tool, which is called International Index of Erectile Function. Five questions, and you will have a score in less than one minute. 
you can then classify this ED in absence of ID, slight, moderate, or severe ED. And then, of course, this is also important for the reproducibility. So when we do PTA and we perform mechanical revascularization, and then we see again the patient, then we have to apply pre and post the score in order to see the improvement. We need to be familiar with the Doppler, dynamic Doppler that usually the patient would bring to you. And so you have to know how many micrograms they were using of alprostadil if they have done redosing. And you need to uh, know how to read the Doppler. So if you are in front of an arterial or a venous insufficiency, which is basically related to a peak systolic velocity less than 25, this is an arterial insufficiency, or an uh, end diastolic velocity greater than five centimeter per second. And this is, of course, uh, venous leakage, poor venous leakage. Then another and probably the last part of the mission is that we, you have to know that you can submit patient to CT and geography. And CT and geography, it's able to show you exactly where is disease among and along the pudendal artery. So we know that majority of disease will be present in zone 4A, 4B, and 5A. So proximal part of the internal pudendal artery, distal part of the internal pudendal artery, or common penile artery. Then, of course, if you bring the path as a vascular surgeon or as a cardiologist, uh, we, we need to know that you can perform, first of all, a CO2 angiography. This is very important. Look in panel A and panel B. You have a complete opacification of the cavernous body related to the fact that, you know, it's a gas. It will diffuse more than uh, contrast media. But you can strut patient in having or not having a fibrosis of the cavernous body. You know, urologists have, uh, usually teach us that when you do not have any sexual relation for many uh, period, and usually the cutoff is 20, 38 months, you will have an increased fibrosis of the cavernous body, which is very difficult to solve, even if you perform a mechanical revascularization. So the first thing that I do is to see if there is a normal uh, CO2 uh, carbon oxide distribution within the cavernous bodies. Then we move to the contrast media, extraction and geography. Clear the utilization of vernal mammary artery catheters, right jacking catheters, in order to perform a selective angiography of the pudendal artery. I usually perform a crossover approach, which is usually better in order to engage the internal pudendal artery. First projection should be an AP projection, and then you tailor the projection, usually homolateral 45 caudal or homolateral 45 cranial, but you have to you know, uh, try to tailorize the best projection for that given patient. Then a, a revolution, you need weapons, and weapons are mainly represented by drug eluding balloon. And in particular, I'm referring to this uh, balloon, which is called Magic Touch, is the only balloon that has a C mark for treatment of erectile dysfunction. It's a very nice technology due to the fact that the balloon eludes Sirolimus, which is uh, uh, lipophobic. It's not like Paclitaxel, which is lipophilic. But the company has found an uh, engineering method in order to mask the serolimus. And so this serolimus is covered with phospholipids, which are lipophilic. And the phospholipids will, be, uh, will cross the uh, endothelial membrane and so release the serolimus within the uh, arterial wall 
uh, for the pH variation. Of course, this technology has other advantage, which however are common to other uh, drug eluding balloons, but you see the coating is uh, uh, done uh, in uh, low pressure inflation and then uh, uniform coating, then the balloon is refolding. And so you do have a circumferential coating and a better in tissue bioavailability of serolimus with uh, this dedicated technology. Show you uh, last but not least one case so you can appreciate what we uh, can do uh, in our cat labs. This was a 54 years old, very young patient, diabetic for more than 22 years, no cardiovascular events, coronary angiography, uh, CT was negative, erectile dysfunction since 2018. This was a patient that we did a couple of months ago. Patient was not responding anymore to PDA5 since one year. As the guidelines recommended, urologists uh, uh, attempted uh, different application of low intensity shockwave therapy with no beneficial effect. IF score, severe erectile dysfunction, uh, less than six as a score. And so he was submitted to pudendal angiography. And this is the pudendal angiography. You can clearly see a diffuse disease of the mid and distal part of the pudendal arteries where the uh, white arrows are uh, located. So in the uh, caudal projection, you can clearly see a tight stenosis in the mid part of the pudendal and a very diffuse disease of the uh, common artery of the um, penile. Uh, what we have done in this particular setting, we have implanted a coronary stent in the mid part of the pudendal artery due to the fact that we tried with the uh, uh, balloon and the result was not satisfactory. So we optimized the result with uh, a non-compliant uh, 2.5 uh, balloon inflation after drug eluding stent implantation. And of course, the distality uh, of the pudendal artery, you know, it was uh, uh, really poor by, by Anjo. So we applied on the right uh, panel uh, 2.0 20 millimeter uh, magic touch. So a uh, serolimus eluding balloon for uh, uh, two minutes. And this is the final results. On the uh, far right, you have a delta in the internal index of erectile function of this patient. The patient moved from uh, a score of six to a score of 22 at six months. So, so we are talking to move a patient from severe ED to almost normal erectile function. And this is the revolution that I'm talking about. Of course, we do have an extensive uh, you know, experience uh, with uh, my group uh, in, in Rome. We are performing a, a registry, which is called Suasion. Uh, these are some uh, preliminary results that we have presented in uh, um, the European Society of Cardiology. And you can clearly see, for instance, at six months that uh, you do have a minimum clinical relevant improvement in more than 70% of the patient with uh, also an improvement in the Doppler uh, peak systolic velocity between baseline and uh, six months follow-up. So this is the uh, revolution uh, approach, and we will have time to discuss it uh, further. So I conclude with uh, the fact that PTA could be technically demanding, but you do obtain good results with steroid in balloon. And of course, we need randomized clinical uh, studies in order to prove that this strategy uh, can be adopted as a second or third line therapy uh, for vasculogenic erectile dysfunction. Thank you very much for your attention. Giuseppe, thank you very much uh, for the nice uh, presentation and overview. So I would ask uh, to stop sharing your screen and to have directly the next presentation from here. Um, due to the technical issues, we have now a delay. But, so give uh, your best to stay on time uh, if it's possible. Thank you very much. And let's have the second presentation from you about adjunctive therapies for erectile dysfunction. Can you hear us, Giuseppe? OK. Yes, I hear you very well. OK, let's uh, go. Okay. 
So how can I... Can you move uh, the slides? Uh, how can I move the slides? Oh, it's yours. Okay, uh, same display. Okay. Okay, this is, uh, you know, for uh, some of you who are, uh, uh, you know, uh, acquainted with uh, this type of therapy, we just publish a, a nice review on, uh, you know, different type of adjunctive therapy for erectile dysfunction. And uh, Federico, the urologist, uh, you know, told uh, some uh, of uh, the adjunctive therapy. The ones that are in the guidelines are low intensity shockwave therapy. There are other also possible therapy. We talk about endovascular therapy and then the future is regeneration uh, therapy. Now, what is the? Uh, I cannot go. Uh, use the mouse. Use the mouse, please. With, uh, with. Oh, okay. Okay. Uh, low intensity shockwave therapy. Uh, what is? Is a passage of acoustic uh, wave, and you have the wave here, uh, where there is a very fast peak rise and a high peak pressure. Uh, very rapid, very short, and there is a high stress a tissue interface. The mechanism of action uh, within the cavernous body are related to the physical forces that this type of therapy can generate with a change in the membrane tension and uh, a mechanism of action which is called a piezo activation. So basically this type of therapy is able to depolarize the membrane, you know, improve dependent signaling pathways within the uh, cavernous uh, body. So uh, if we wanna see, oh, I need to go back. Could you please go back? Okay, thank you very much. If you want to see what are the type of uh, uh, mechanical effects that we can create theoretically with this type of therapy, uh, first of all, there is an uh, 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 increase in the recruitment of endothelial progenitor cells. There is an increase in neoangiogenesis. There is an improvement in vasodilatation. And there is also a Zwan cell activation with improvement in uh, nitrogenic uh, NO production. So you have a vasodilatation effect, you have an anti-inflammatory effect, you have a nerve regeneration, and you do have a, a tissue remodeling with low intensity molecular uh, shockwave therapy. And this has been clearly demonstrated, and this is the reason why uh, this type of therapy is second line therapy in the guidelines. These are meta analysis, and you can clearly see that patients treated with the low intensity shockwave therapy are, uh, you know, they do better respond also to PDA5 in order um, after administration due to the, um, all the effect that I uh, just told you. Uh, then the other, uh, you know, type of therapy that you may encounter in your clinical practice are related to, you know, PRP, so platter rich plasma. Uh, you can have autologous uh, PRP or heterologous PRP, but however, the same mechanism of action that you see with low intensity shockwave therapy, then you may have stem cell therapy, again, autologous or heterologous, but these are type of therapy that are usually related to, you know, post-traumatic, so nerve regeneration. Uh, what is uh, quite new in the field is the peripheral blood mononuclear cells, so autologous peripheral blood mononuclear cells injection in the intracavernous body. And the, the repair of the tissue is related to a paracrine effect, uh, both with the uh, you know, production of uh, uh, neovascularization cytokines, uh, exosome production, and uh, uh, amelioration of uh, lipid in terms of uh, removal of, of oxidized uh, phospholipids within uh, the tissue itself with the net effect of a tissue repair and neoangiogenesis. Uh, now, we have also, you know, trying to 
uh, do combined therapy. This is just a, an example of a case report that we just published at the European Society of Cardiology. But you can clearly see on the right panel that a combination therapy between PTA with Sirolimus saludin balloon and intracavernous uh, PBMNS injection you can clearly see that neovascularization that you can obtain one year after in uh, this uh, diabetic patient with uh, this uh, type of therapy. Uh, of course, this is a summary slide, a nice review that was uh, uh, quite recently published in uh, Nature uh, Urology, where you do have you know, all the type of uh, adjunctive therapy that you can uh, obtain. Uh, personally speaking, I do not think that this treatment will raise the death. That uh, needs to be uh, clear. But I do believe that uh, patients who are mild to moderate vasculogenic ED, they can uh, you know, benefit uh, from this type of adjunctive therapy. And I do believe that this type of therapy will play an important role in penile rehabilitation or, again, as adjunctive therapy after mechanical revascularization. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much, uh, Giuseppe, uh, and uh, thanks to all the panelists. Unfortunately, due to the technical issues, we didn't have the time for further discussion. I think you have a very nice overview of all current treatments and uh, the potential that has the mechanical revascularization. So we are outside there now. If you want to learn more about you can go also to Concept Medical, who supported uh, this, um, uh, let's say, symposium in order to ask further questions uh, uh, the specialists. Thank you very much for your attention. Enjoy the next session.